Hello. How's everybody doing? Sorry, I'm trying to get this all situated here. Move this over. There we go. Hopefully you're all having a good day so far. It's like plenty of people are joining in. I'm doing okay, other than the sick wife and kids, but my wife has a cold and my kids have pink eye, so they don't feel too great either. So that's what they get for going to going to school with all the other grubby little children, right? So it's all good though. I also want this to go to let's see. Now what I can do is get all this switched around. Chat there. Okay. And now the slideshow's on the wrong page. That's cool. Let's see. change the screen there we go hello hello glad to see a bunch of people joining in good to see you good to see you hopefully this format's okay for today um like i said you guys don't have to go out in the cold so looks like it stopped snowing a little bit but still cold out there So today, let me pull up our stuff for this week. I don't know what the folder emoji is, but hello. Let's pull up our assignment for this week. So. Uh, we're swapping off of Photoshop this week. So if you're sick and tired of Photoshop, your Photoshop pain is over, at least for now. And we're going to move into Illustrator this week. So this next assignment is a two-week assignment, but let me get this all figured out here. Sorry, I have to do my dual factor again. Okay. So, like I said, this this assignment this week is a two two week assignment in Illustrator. Oh, the folder has a hello inside of it. If you click on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's go here. Perfect. So we are jumping into design number four. I'm gonna blow this up a little bit so it's easier for y'all to see. So we're gonna be working on creating your own game logos for the assignment. So what that means is that um, I want you guys to build a logo from scratch, right? So we're going to talk about some things today in our, um, in our lecture that kind of go over branding, um, readability, readability, visual hierarchy, and branding so that you can kind of get an idea of how some of those things operate. These all really play into logo design quite a bit, as well as some other things too. But this is, this really coincides with what we're working on today and for the next two weeks. But the assignment is that you guys are going to work on a game logo based off of one of these images. So I'm only giving you two options here. 
one to keep it in scope two to limit the possibilities of the stuff that i get back it keeps grading easier on the tas and then i just like to see everybody's ideas if i kind of hone it in a little bit i in the past i didn't i didn't take you know two screenshots i just kind of said create your own game logos and i just didn't love the results so i feel like with this i can say hey based off of these two screenshots build build a logo that represents these games right so um so you don't have to do both you can just pick one of the screenshots okay but the game logo you're going to be creating is completely up to you you can take in the things that you see the environment the colors you know the color palette those types of things and you're going to pull from those to help build that screenshot right I have another discussion next week to talk about color, size, and emphasis. Um, so we're going to go over how to create something that's eye-catching and iconic, right? We're going to go over a little bit, bit, little bit of that today with our visual hierarchy stuff, but we're going to try to create something that's eye-catching, right? You want to pull people in. You got to think of it as being on the front cover of the game, right? What is going to be something when it's sitting on the shelf that's going to capture somebody, right? going to capture mom and dad or grandma and grandpa when they're out buying video games for the kids for Christmas, right? So sometimes you need to remember too that less is more in logo design. Sometimes when you add too much to something, it creates a little bit of uh, chaos. And there's, you know, sometimes that's okay, but sometimes it can det detract from your overall design, right? So if it gets too crowded or messy, you're just throwing a million things at the screen to try to make this logo, it can end up making it worse than making it better, right? So here's some inspirations from just some recent things and some retro things as far as logos go. Think Some things are a little bit simplistic. Some are a little bit more advanced, right? But we grabbed, um, you know, some iconic things. Take a look at here, right? Pokemon's always got the iconic you know illustrated text and then they do a good job of trying to you know add on to each one of their things right unite in itself if you covered up pokemon unite could be a logo in itself right the pokemon branding is just attached to it to help sell right then you've got something like metroid dread where it's a little more simplistic but they do a good job at the characterization of the text and then the two-tone really helps sell that right there right the gunk's a cool one really interesting typeface font that they're or custom font right that they they've put together for this sort of that painterly brush stroke nothing too crazy here right they just sort of wrote the the name of the gang but you know did a good job at stylizing that overwatch obviously is a huge one you know you have the o and the w in there that logo is pretty iconic Mortal Kombat, Gears, Roblox. Roblox is a pretty simple one, but recognized all over the place, right? Other ones too, a lot of text-based logos in this example. So you don't necessarily have to do text, right? A couple of non-text-related logos here in the middle. Roblox, Overwatch, Mortal Kombat, those types of things, right? Gears. So I'm looking that's that's what i'm looking for from you right build a logo based off of these two screenshots right i know this is an actual game so i don't know if i would go and try to reverse image search these right oh you never noticed the o and w in overwatch yeah it's an o and then a w yep now you'll never unsee it yep um so I, like I said, I know this is an actual game right here. So don't go trying to dig the internet and try to find what the name of the game is. Somebody probably already knows it in the chat, but um, come up with something unique and original, something you're on your own, right? Um, and then take your inspiration from this one. This is just something that like uh, indie developer was working on. It's kind of a Mario esque type of game a little bit but i really enjoyed the sort of soft rounded blocks that they were using 
Um, I can show you a couple of the logos that I created in the past for these games or for what we were working on. Um, just to give you an idea so I can show you the couple that I built quickly in class last time or last semester. So I did this one for the top game here and I need to change this to the right color here. So this is what I built for that top game here in the last semester. Um, and then I also did, let's see, for the blocky one, something like this. And this was just me messing around here. So we've done a couple different ones and I'll demonstrate today and we'll come up, try to come up with something new here. But um, those were the two different logos I put together, the games, just in class. Um, questions on the assignment, go ahead and throw a couple questions in there. I wanna try to make sure you guys understand what the, what the goal is here. And then what you're gonna do is just turn in a couple screenshots, a couple exported PNGs of your logo, right? You could even throw it over the top of the screenshot here if you wanted to, to try to make it look nice. But yeah. Okay. Any questions? I know there's plenty of people in there unless I just did a, such an amazing job of explaining it but if not we can move into my lecture portion but main difference between Photoshop and Illustrator we'll get in that today because I'm going to go over I guess I don't need a couple of PNGs that's probably a good good point just one PNG Unless you wanted to do like your logo in one and then put it over the screenshot of the game, whatever. Yeah, exactly, master. Yep. Yeah, name it yourself. Come up with a name. Come up with a, a design for the logo. It, it doesn't have to be the actual name for the game. You're coming up with a name for the game and a logo for the game based off of this screenshot. So you could say Viking quest or something for this and block jumper or whatever. I don't know, whatever you want to call them. You could come up with, I'm sure you, you guys have imaginations. So you'll come up with a name and then the logo and the logo can be a part. The name can be a part of the logo. It doesn't necessarily have to, right? The logos, uh, for just promotion material, right? So something like this. You could think of it being used on the front of the box or something like this, right? Just a logo. So uh, the main difference between Photoshop, somebody asked earlier, is Photoshop is a raster based program and Illustrator is a vector based program. So raster depends a lot on pixels and vector is all like math and calculations so it's uh it's not too different in the sense of the the interface feels really similar um however there's some things in illustrator that make your life a lot easier um when you're starting to design you can see all these different i do logos on the side for companies so like um you know, there's all different types of stuff you can do inside of, inside of Illustrator, right? But that's really the biggest difference, raster versus, versus vector. And then the tools, the tools are a lot different. There's not a lot of paint brushes inside of Illustrator. It's lots of using shapes and things to build other shapes. So we'll, we'll get into that and I'll show you.
Um, yeah, the the late policy is, you know, if if you miss the deadline, that's okay. Just message me on Discord and we can work it out, okay? Um, no, it's gonna be an illustrator. Yeah, well, just an illustrator for this one. If you want to do like initial sketching in Photoshop, that's fine. But we're gonna do the majority of it in Illustrator. Yes. Yep. This is all recorded. The nice thing here is that being on YouTube is my the recording stays live and is saved onto my YouTube channel forever under the VODs. So, um, yeah, you can watch it back as many times as you need. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through the lecture and then the, the intro to Illustrator portion will be there for you to rewatch as many times as you want, okay? Okay, good questions. So let's go, let's jump into our, our lecture portion here, okay? So, like I said, we're talking about readability, visual hierarchy, and branding today, okay? So let me, let me turn myself off here. I think I can do that while we're going through this. Actually, I'll just make myself a little smaller. Oops. Sorry, that thing got all jacked up. Now I fixed it. Okay. Get my face out of the way. So when we're talking about readability, um, there's a dominant definition that you're going to hear when we're talking about it. Okay. The arrangement of fonts, that definition is the arrangement of fonts and words in order to make a written content flow in a simple easy to read manner, right? That's the definition that you're going to hear. However, when when we're talking about readability in this games space, I like to kind of change up this definition a little bit um, into something that makes more sense and means more to us as game designers, game artists, right? So let's let's take a look at that. Okay. So my updated definition here is the arrangement of design elements in order to make the final product's content flow in a simple and easy to read manner, right? So it changes a little bit of that definition. So all the elements, and like with, with that being said, all the elements within that design should be visual, visually distinguishable from one another, okay? Here's some really, really bad logo design, okay? just because of the readability and the way that it looks, right? This is not a good look, even though you can see what they're doing here, <laughs> but the end result just does not look great, right? Where instead, this is a lot, you know, a lot cleaner and the arrangement of these elements, right? Makes this content flow in a much simpler and easy to read manner, right? So this was the design before. This is a little suspect, right? For sure. Um, and, you know, <laughs> so is the, the this one, right? Just some bad logo design. This is a lot better, a little bit cleaner, makes more sense. People would actually probably buy your products. This is just seems a little silly. Same with this one, right? So visually distinguishable from one another. This kind of flows into something that you're probably not wanting to show same with this, right? So as we're talking about readability, these principles don't only apply to logos, right? You know, they they can they can apply to every aspect of a design, ranging from character design, right? We're talking about readability and as far as thumbnails go, this is a practice you do in character design to make sure the character makes sense in its silhouette form, right? 
to understand the readability of this character. Make sense. Make sure that everything makes sense here, right? As well as heads up displays, right? Everything here is in an easy, simple to read manner. Manner, I think. Metroid Prime is one of the best examples of a heads up interface in any game I've ever played. One, it's just everything is right where you need it to be when you're playing the game, right? Stuff is easy to read, it's simple to follow. Um, it's it's a great logo design, or it's a great heads up display, right? So readability can apply to a lot of different things in our designs. So when we're talking about characters, right? If, if your initial silhouette is hard to read, it can have a poor waterfall effect that can lead to an even worse design of your character, right? That's why we go through this practice of these thumbnail sketches um, and other things too, like when you have a first pass of something, a second pass, right? You're going through and trying to make sure that things make sense and readability is a big part of that, especially with front-facing end-user objects and interfaces okay so when we're talking about huds or heads up displays a good huds primary objective is to provide the user with information quickly efficiently and with minimal effort right on the part of the player our eyes should be drawn to the crucial information without having to search for it okay so when you're playing a game i shouldn't have to go through a million different button clicks to find the thing I need on my HUD, right? If you have in-game menus, that's fine, but the HUD should quickly portray all the information to the player that they need to know in their current situation, right? So here's a few examples of some really, really, really good heads up displays. And I would say that there's a good, there's a better, and there's a best here, right? I think Assassin's Creed, this is two or Brotherhood, I think. I can't remember exactly which one it is here, but all of those are pretty, pretty simple. So the HUD is very simple, right? Map, and you'll, this is very, this is used a lot in, in the industry today, right? Very similar interfaces. One, because if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? And two, just because it, it makes it very easy to see what's going on, right? In Assassin's Creed, the two things that matter the most to you are, you know, your infamy level and how much health do you have? And then you've got some other things too, right? Where am I on the map? How much money do I have? What weapon am I using currently, right? This is all kind of displayed to you in the best way possible. So the best thing here, this is dead space, okay? The HUD in Dead Space is awesome, right? Because the HUD in Dead Space is all portrayed on the back of, of Jacob, who's the main character, right? So I can't remember off the top of my head exactly which one is which here, but one is health and like one is energy of your weapon. And it's on his back. So there's no HUD in Dead Space, at least the original. I don't know how they did it in the remake, but these are this is from the original, right? So you have you know the the health bar on his back and then i think it's his energy level or his shield i can't remember which one it is i haven't played it in a long time but there's no hud this is your hud and it's all the information you need in a game like that it's quick it's it's fast paced it's it's you know heart pumping you know so i just need to look at the back of my character and i can see my status right and then i would so i would say this is good right there's still some things that i don't love here it's kind of boring and plain yeah, health is the back, and then I think this is something else. So, um, so this is good. This is better, right? And then I think uh, Persona Five has one of the best interfaces I've ever seen, just because it's so in your face and just very uh, easy to read and understand what's going on, right? And it's also just so st so damn stylish, right? Um, they do a really good job of this sort of in your face type of uh, interface where things are easy to read on the screen because of the high contrasting colors with the red and the white and the big fat text, right? Um, so I think they do a really, really good job 
in Persona. This this would be the best, right? Good, better, best. And this is not where it stops. This style flows through all of their menu systems and everything. But during battle, very easy to see what you need to see, right? It's super eye-catching, yes. So. Next thing I want to talk about here is visual hierarchy, okay? I keep needing to move my face around. Sorry. Okay. So visual hierarchy is used to rank design elements and influence the order you want your users to view them, right? So the image here on the left, right, is before using visual hierarchy, right? So before all these images are kind of the same size, there's no rhyme or reason to what's happening here. It's just a scuba diver and a whale, right? There, there's nowhere for your eye to kind of focus on and then gradually flow across the screen, right? So using principles like contrast, scale, balance, um, you can help establish each element in your design in the right in its rightful place, right? Um, and you can also help certain elements really stand out, right? So the nice thing here is after sort of applying what we know about visual hierarchy here, we've blown up the whale, made him big, right? There's something that we can kind of focus on here and then gradually let our eye scan the rest of the page, right? There's something that's bringing your attention versus this where everything's sort of the same size and in the same plane, right? We're here, we're using that, that visual hierarchy, the scale, you know, contrast, those types of things, right? So what I want to talk about here is using scale to your advantage, right? Size is going to be one of your most effective tools in order to emphasize specific areas of your design, right? When things are big and bold, they stand out, right? There's a reason why so many different outlets throw giant word images in your face, right? It gets you to pay attention. Billboards, game covers, product placement, all these things, the big bold words get you to pay attention, right? When somebody's walking across and scanning things, bam, the, the big, huge, bold words are in your face. You see them, you have to pay attention, right? So scale, it doesn't have to be words either. But, you know, in Call of Duty, for instance, it is. Okay. Also, the contrasting here of the red and the white on the dark background really help bring you into. Okay. Next one here to talk about is perspective, right? So, perspective can create depth. Again, we've got two images here that we can t discuss a little bit. Designers can create an illusion of depth ranging from a few inches to several miles long, right? Or several miles deep. So we generally perceive larger objects as being closer than similar smaller objects. So if we go back here to our um, let's go back, right? Larger object closer to us, smaller object farther away, right? So these objects will usually command attention before any other design element on the page, right? With the big whale in our face, it's the first thing we see, right? So here's another image where there's no real perspective here. Again, we've got everything sort of on the same plane, right? The desk, the chair, the lamp, the, all the stuff on the desk, the lat, the person, everything is sort of all jumbled up and messed together. We're here, we've changed the perspective right? We changed it to a top down, right? Yeah. It's more about filling space too, for sure. Yeah. So afterwards we've changed that perspective. We've made things a little bit easier to see. We've also made the image a lot more interesting, right? We're filling space on the page one, but we're also making things easier to read in a better, you know, again, we can go back to 
what we said before here, right? So, right? We're making the arrangement of the design elements flow in a simple and easy to read manner, right? Much easier to see all the different elements on the page here than it was here, right? Kind of a jumbled mess, a lot more interesting to look at, easier to read, right? GameCube here, without the depth of this perspective, the GameCube logo would be pretty boring, right? But the reason it's really iconic is this, you know, isometric view of this cube, right? So makes it a little bit easier to read, a little bit more interesting to look at. So talking about the next thing here, color and contrast. So just like size, bright hues can usually draw greater attention than duller colors, right? For example, you're reading this text right now. The one thing that's standing out to you is the, the green word, right? Because it's a different color. It's gonna draw your eye in, okay? If a single word in a sentence is highlighted with a bright color, it's going to stand out, right? That's the first thing you're going to notice on the page. It's highlighted in green. So your eye is going to be drawn to it, right? Use that in your designs. So dramatically contrasting colors can emphasize specific design elements more than gentle scale, right? Spider-Man, bam. It's a different contrast than the, the black dark background, right? And then the miles portion of that is in the red. Red, white, and black is super popular. You're gonna notice it in a lot of different things. There's probably five different restaurants I could name that all use this type of color scheme just because it works and it's impactful, okay? So, placing red on a green background will have a greater effect or greater impact than red on an orange background, right? Contrasting colors. We'll talk more about color next week in our in our discussion too but okay so moving forward and talking more a little bit about contrast designs that use too many contrasting colors can lead to unorganized or incohesive products this web page here is a massive mess right and the biggest the biggest crime is probably the the rainbow prism background right and then putting red on that just is is just bad and then you've got all different sorts of horrible low res images different colors there's no rhyme or reason to what's going on here right so the same can be said for using color schemes that don't adhere to the principles of color theory which again we'll talk about next week a little bit more right so contrasting colors in contrast in general, color choice and contrast can drastically affect your audience's ability to discern the background from the design itself. So it's it's a reason why we've spent a lot of time talking about color or will spend time talking about color and we've talked about perspective too, right? So, you know, the red and green is a lot easier to look at than this chartreuse and pink, right? I want a colorful black, yeah. <clears throat> these are hard to look at where the orange on the gray background is a little bit easier to look at right a little bit more palatable contrast happening here it's also overwatch's color scheme which is kind of why i picked it too <coughs> so just to talk about a few more thoughts on visual hierarchy um there's a really good article that you can read through okay um if you go to this link here and i'll put the slides up you can read through it it's super interesting there's there's a lot more principles to it but i pulled the ones that are really helpful for what we're doing this week okay so you can check this out the next thing i want to talk about Kay, is branding and branding is something that's going to be really important for you this week um when we are going through and building these logos, right? So you've got two weeks to design it too. So, so far it's the thing that we've spent the most time on in the class up to this point, okay? All right, let's keep going through here. Thanks, SpongeBob. So 
when we're talking about branding, right? A brand is a feature or set of features that distinguish one organization from another, right? A brand is typically comprised of a name, tagline, a logo, or a symbol. Um, they have design, brand voice, right? There's, there's so many things that play into these brands. It also refers to the overall experience when a customer uh, begins interacting with said business, right? There's a reason why the kids all wanted Cocoa Puffs on the shelf over the Cocoa Roos, right? These are the ones my mom would buy because we were poor. But all the, you know, I always wanted the Cocoa Puffs because they just looked cooler, right? And I think this is even a newer updated box, but back in the day, they were still way cooler looking too, right? This brings you in. This this is an experience. This is just a brown bag of chocolate balls, right? <laughs> it just doesn't... There's nothing super appealing about this. This is grabbing the kids' attention on the cereal aisle, making a beg mom and dad, right? So let's change our process, our thought process here for a minute when we're talking about branding, okay? I, I had a different, you know, we talked about a different definition a little bit. And again, I'm, I'm kind of following that same theme here, so. I want us to sh shift gears here and say a brand is a feature or set of features that distinguish one game from another. A brand is typically comprised of a name, tagline, logo, symbol, design, brand voice, and more. It also refers to the overall experience a customer owner grows when interacting with a game, right? So three ways that brands or branding affects games that you've been shown your entire life without possibly noticing, right? So the first thing we could talk about here with branding is mascots. You all probably know these dudes, right? Um, some may be a little bit pop more popular than others. Some may have way better marketing campaigns than others. Some may have died after a few games in the series, right? Some may be riding on the coattails of others, but all these mascots represent different brands and you can probably name them, right? Mario and Nintendo, Master Chief and Xbox. Unfortunately, Jack and Daxter with PlayStation and they kind of died off, but they were their mascot when the PlayStation 2 erupted, right? And then Sonic has always been chasing Mario since the early days of Sega, right? So there are some very big pros and cons when we're talking about mascots, right? Mascots are the most versatile form of branding, right? You can license all manner of products. You can probably name to me, you know, a hundred different products that have Mario on them. Toothpaste, plates, underwear, you know, all types of stuff, blankets, toys, anything you can think of that they can paste Mario on, they've probably done it, right? Maybe not so much with Master Chief, but I have seen quite a few things that have Master Chief on it. Jack and Daxter, unfortunately, you know, kind of never got that approach, but Sonic definitely has, right? So the cons with using a mascot as your main branding focus is it can be limited, you know, and the heavy lifting is done by that mascot himself while your game becomes secondary. People love Mario just because they love Mario. They, you know, they love Mario games, but people love Mario. Where that's sort of where Jack and Daxter died in a sense, right? When you try to make those mascots do all the heavy lifting, those game, the games become secondary. So Master Chief has, you know, the, the backing behind him to help. And I think Sonic does too. So the next thing here to talk about in branding, branding wise are mega franchises. Okay. You've seen these your, your whole life too. I'm, I'm sure. Right. Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty that we already talked about, Gears, Battlefield, Final Fantasy. These are mega franchises, right? Multiple games in the series for these game, these, these games, right? So. There's pros and cons to this as well. And let's talk about them here. 
So, the pros and cons with using these mega franchises is these mega franchises can be huge impacts on pop culture, right? Grand Theft Auto 5 will not die. It's a pop culture phenomenon, right? People are streaming and living a second life inside of that game, right? Fans also know what to expect when they see something from this franchise. When you see a Call of Duty, you know what you're going to get. When you see a Final Fantasy, you kind of know what you're going to get. Sometimes those change a little bit. But Battlefield, Gears, those types of mega franchises, you know what you're going to get. And there's so many other mega franchises that I could have listed. Halo, you know, other different mega franchises, okay? Something else, too, is it makes sequels in those series way easier to design. And they are just cash cows you are basically printing money every time you make one of these games right so the problem with these mega franchises though and the cons to using them is that it's hard to keep up the quality and consistency of these games right and every one of us can name out of all those mega franchises that i listed all of us can name one that probably didn't hit the mark right out of those lists that i put up there Okay, the franchise has complete control. Once you establish a design, you're pretty locked in. It's hard for them to make changes to that design. If somebody were to say, okay, Battlefield's gonna be a third person RPG, people would be like, no, we're not buying this. We're not taking this, right? Okay, we're making Final Fantasy a first person shooter. That's not gonna go over well, right? With the, with the people that are purchasing these games, okay? So the last sort of form here to talk about in this branding is studio branding, okay? These big name studios that you've all probably heard of, they're using the studio itself as the branding, okay? So places like Valve, Blizzard before the giant scandal, right? And we're gonna get into that, Devolver, from software you've all seen that these <laughs> and from software's feeling a little bit of pressure right now and we'll talk about that here in just a second but this is using the studio as your branding right so let's talk about some of the pros and cons for each of these the pros to having your studio be your branding right is that it's the most rewarding. It's the thing that everybody wants, right? Every company that starts to make games ends up wanting this, or this is the goal, right? Where we can say, okay, this studio is untouchable, right? Whatever we put out, people are gonna buy, right? Consumer, the, our consumers are actively interested in our success, right? And our games just sell themselves because all we do is we slap our our company name on that game and and everyone's gonna buy it because they trust us right here's the problem blizzard probably the most recent controversy with them all of you know what's been going on there right if you betray your studio branding and you lose the hearts of your consumers it's over right blizzard is having a hard time right now um just because you know they've lost the faith of their audience and their main consumers. They had the scandal and then you can see how much, you know, hell they've gotten, how, how big of a problem they had with their big name titles. Wow. Was it a low subscriber point before they put out the last expansion? Diablo immortal was a huge problem and controversy, right? So again, from software's in this stage where they're at the height, right? They just put out Elden Ring. They won game of the year, okay? Then they announced a new Armored Core game and everyone's like, is it gonna be Elden Ring? No, it's Armored Core. Well, we love Elden Ring. It's like, well, this is Armored Core. Well, well no, we want Elden Ring. It's like, okay. So now From Software's in this point where it's like, okay, we know we've we've established this as okay we made dark souls we can make these amazing games right we made bloodborne dark souls elden ring people don't really remember armored core because that was 
previous from software so they have this thing where they need to drop this armored core and it needs to do well for them so anyways destroying your studio branding can be detrimental detrimental is often unrecoverable there's a reason why blizzard sold to microsoft microsoft has that trust and has won over the hearts of the gaming community in the past few years as being the gamers company right so they feel like they can save blizzard a little bit anyways building a brand takes time and effort okay that's the main takeaway here whether you're doing a mascot you're trying to build these mega franchises or you're trying to create your studios the next valve or devolver digital right okay that's all i've got as far as our slides go so I will post these up on the canvas page for you and you can go through them a little bit. Let me put them in the files page really quick. Okay, those should be up on the canvas page now. If you want a refresher and to talk about those again, or take a look through them again, you can, okay? Um, what I wanna to try to shift gears into a little bit here is I want to jump into a little bit of a introduction into Illustrator and then possibly talk about some of my thought processes in, in going through my own logo design here, okay? So, um, any questions as far as th that stuff goes that we just covered? If not, I'll keep rolling forward, but let me get Photoshop booted up here or not Photoshop. Sorry. Illustrator. If not, that's okay. And we can keep rolling. Okay. Nobody has anything to say and that's okay. Hopefully I haven't put you all to sleep. All right. So, um, let's go through a little bit of an intro into illustrator. Okay. The first thing you're going to notice is when you open up illustrator, very much the same sort of interface as Photoshop. When you first open it up, it's going to show you all your recent files that you've been working on, right? You can do something that you're going to notice too is that when you hit new file there's a little bit different sort of approach and a little bit different approach to what you're building here right it's going to say hey are you making something for an hdtv or are you building a custom sized object are you working on a web page are you working on something else letter sized things right so really it doesn't matter for what we're doing today so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build a custom size document here. You can also see that there's a bunch of different other options here. We're working on a print file for film. We're doing things for art and illustration, right? Postcards, posters, all that kind of stuff. Here's some more templates that you can take a look at. So again, we're just going to go, oh, are you working on something for an iPhone? So here we're just going to do a custom sized image. I'm going to say it's a 1080 by 1080. That's fine. Or a 1920 by 1080 is fine too. It doesn't really matter. And then I'm going to hit create here. Okay. You can also change your different colors. We're going to keep it in CMYK. And we'll talk more about these next week with the color, the color discussion. Okay. So I'm going to hit create here. And we are going to take a look at some tools here as well as the interface. So You'll notice the interface is very, very similar to Photoshop. So you've got your toolbox over here on the left hand. You've got your shelf up here um, with all the different menus that you can go through. Little less, little less complicated up here than Photoshop. Not as men, not as much going on on the shelf up here. But you do have these tabs over on the right hand side, and you can also change the layout based off of what you're trying to do here. We're going to stick to the essentials layout for right now. 
But what I want to do is talk about the main difference between Photoshop and Illustrator, okay? The main game of Illustrator is you're building a lot of shapes, right? You're using the shape tool to build shapes, right? And you're using these shapes to create other shapes. You can draw, there's the pen tool where you can go through and draw and sort of create whatever shapes you want. But the main thing here is using these shapes, right? And we're using these vector-based shapes to create more shapes, right? So we have to talk about how this functions a little bit. Inside of Photoshop, or sorry, I'm gonna keep saying that. Inside of Illustrator, you have two different tools that are sort of your mainstay tools, the things that allow you to directly interact with the object you're working on, right? What you have here is your direct select and your main select. Main select is the little black arrow here, okay? And, and they're called, this is just called selection tool, right? And I'm gonna refer to them as these direct, your main select and then direct select because this one actually is called direct select. So what main select does is it allows you to click on the object, move it around. It also allows you to interact with these different individual anchor points on the object, right? You can see that I, I created a square with my shape tool, with just my rectangle tool. I can create these shapes, right? So. Um, with the direct select, it works a little bit different. So main select, right? I can click on an object. I can interact with all the different little anchor points here. There's different points on here that I can interact with. Okay. That are only usable in direct select, or sorry, in main select with direct select the white arrow. This functions a little bit differently. This gives you a little bit more interactivity with the object you're working with. Okay. So if I use this little arrow and I click one object or one button here, sorry, one individual point or anchor point, you'll see that now I can move and select and change this shape and really manipulate it with these anchor points, right? Now, when I'm in main select, I can't do this. I can only select on the individual object itself and change its size and shape. I don't have any direct control over the individual anchor points where with direct select I do. I can click on that point and really adjust and change what this object is doing, right? So I can drastically change what this, what this object is very quickly, right? So main select, clicking and moving, changing the size of an object, right? or a shape where main or that's main select and then direct select allows you to interact with each individual anchor point on these shapes right so shapes are built out of a few different things okay and we're going to talk about these too so shapes inside of illustrator are built out of what are called paths okay these paths can can also be created with our pen tool right or our curvature tool. So with the pen tool, you can see I can draw, if I don't have anything on a fill or the stroke, I can just sit here and draw and create this path, right? Which now I can interact with this path directly by clicking on my direct select and clicking on each one of these individual anchor points on the path, okay? So these paths are what build up these shapes. These paths can have a fill to them and a stroke level to them. So I'll show you. When I use my pen tool, it's very much a point and click type of pen tool, right? I'm creating a polygon with this, right? If I click on the fill, you'll see I can go to all these different fill colors, but I also have a stroke that can be applied to this as well, right? And I can change the thickness of that stroke. So I can create these shapes very easily with this tool. And then with between direct select and main select, 
I can change and manipulate this, this shape even further, okay? But these are built out of paths. So how do we create these paths? There's a few different tools that we have available to us, right? Everything in the, in the program is gonna create this path. We have a few different ways of interacting with these paths and creating them, right? So we have our pen tool, which is our really our main sort of design tool. If you click, the pen tool is something that you kind of have to get used to a little bit inside of Illustrator, just because it's, it's a different beast than what we were working with in Photoshop. We can click these different points and just create these sort of jaggedy lines, right? But we can also click and click the second point and pull and create these curves. And then the second point is gonna try to flow off of that first curve you, you made, right? So I can really use, you know, this curve to create these sort of oblong curved shapes, right? And that's just using the pen tool, right? So clicking, there's two different ways that, that that pen tool can function. Click, 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 right? Click, finished off that object. Or click one point, click the next point and pull on the mouse while holding the left mouse button. And that's gonna create a curve. So you can decide exactly how that, you want that to work, right? Or you can click that point and click this point again and it's gonna go back to being straight again so and then the same thing applies when i have direct select and main select so direct select i can get in here click on these individual anchor points and really manipulate the shape that i just built right change exactly what's going on here i can click on these individual anchor points or i can click on the path itself and manipulate the path right really changing the overall shape of the object and what I designed, right? Very easy way of creating shapes, right? A lot of shape-based creation happening inside of Illustrator, okay? So the next one that we have, so that's the, the pen tool. The next one we have is the curvature tool. And this is just sort of another version of the pen tool, but this one really does work in curves only so this one's good when you're trying to build these more fluid shapes okay these are both tools that you kind of have to get used to a little bit so as you're drawing around with them it's going to try to follow the path of least resistance when you're using this curve tool Okay, same thing applies, right? Direct select, we can click on an, on each one of these points or paths. We can click on the little anchor points and adjust what this curve is actually doing here, okay? So we can really get in here and change how this path works. Then the next thing that we have here is the shape tool. So the shape tool is what you think it is. I'm building individual shapes in this space, right? I have the ability to create a polygon. I can say I want a five-sided, I want a three-sided, I want an eight-sided with a radius of 50 pixels, right? So it built me this pentagon, right? And I can adjust this and change this and do whatever I want with this, okay? We also have the star tool. It's kind of interesting. If you click, you can say, I want a five pointed star or a four pointed star, right? And you hit okay. And it's going to build you a star. It's pretty nice. Okay. And then you have the line segment tool. And this one is basically just allows you to draw straight lines that you can use very much like the line tool in Photoshop, right? You can adjust this as much as you want. Okay, you're able to build lines and things of that nature. Nothing too crazy with the line tool, but this is the shape tool. So get in, to, get in there and mess with those shapes. It's very, very nice. So we also have the brush tool. Now this brush tool operates a little bit differently than you would think. Okay, 
this tool is a brush in the sense that it works like a brush in Photoshop. You can upsize it and size it down with the same bracket keys. You also notice that it does some line correction for you as you use it, right? Um, and you're actually painting with this versus using the other pen tool in the program. So this can be helpful if you just wanna sort of freehand a shape or build a shape or an object or a line, right? And do that freehand. This brush does not have a ton of options to it. You can see that it has a few different brush strokes, a few different brush heads that you can use and, and select from. You can also choose how much that brush um, is corrected, right? So you can say under the paintbrush options, under the tool options here while you're in the paint paintbrush on the right hand side. It will say, you know, how much do I want this to be, f you know, in the fidelity? Do I want it to be more accurate to what I'm drawing or do I want it to try to smooth out what I'm drawing, right? So you can mess with a few other things here too. So as I'm, as I'm drawing this, right, you'll notice that it's doing a very good job of trying to smooth out my brush stroke. So if you have kind of shaky hands, this can be super helpful for you. Sometimes it can be annoying though, if you're trying to work on something and you can't get it to get the right shape because it's trying to correct everything you do, right? So that can be a little bit annoying. We also have a text tool that allows you to type text like every other piece of software that you have. Um, the nice thing that the text tool has is that you can type along a path. So when you're starting to do your logos, let's say I created, you know, a circle. And this can be kind of cool. So if I have my shape tool here and I have, excuse me, I have this ellipse, right? And let's say I just want it to have a black stroke to it and no fill. Let's say my, the logo I'm working on, I wanna be able to type along this path. So I can say type on a path and I click the path. And now I can type on this circle, which is pretty cool. So I can say at 40 point, I can go and it's gonna type all the way around that circle. Pretty cool. Um, it doesn't have to be a circle. It follows whatever path you design. So I can show you a few examples um, from some other logos I've done, but um, no, you can you could download some text if you wanted to. That's I I mean I'm kind of torn there. Like I'd I'd like for you to try to do as much of it as possible on your own. Like the last thing I want you to do is just say here's my logo, right? And you know, download somebody else's font and just blow this up to like you know. 200 point font and say, here's my game logo, right? And all you did was download a font. Like that's, that's what I want to avoid, right? If that makes sense. Like, wow, I did so much work here. I downloaded one font. There's my logo, right? That's that's not what I want you to do. So if, if you can build the text yourself by doing it with, you know, the pen tool and creating some sort of cool, you know, typeface that you've worked, you know, hard on to make, you know, some sort of cool font, right? You know, we did something that you've created by yourself right this goes a little bit further for me if that makes sense so a couple other things to talk about so that's the the text you have rotate and scale tools these are pretty easy to use pretty straightforward um if you draw you know a shape in here and you go to rotate this you can click and rotate based on a point. So pretty easy to use. Um, scale and reflect also work very similarly to shear is a little bit interesting. It allows you to cut off certain parts of a, of a object, but I really don't use that a whole lot because of the next tool here. Okay. 
you have your eraser which allows you to erase things really easily um let's say you have a shape here you can take the eraser and erase a part of the object off of it which is which is helpful because it allows you to then delete pieces out of here so this can be a really cool way to go and and make some interesting shapes you kind of saw it in the example they did something like this they bumped up the size of that eraser did something where they created something like this right and now they have this interesting shape right so that's the eraser the next tool here is the one that i find to be one of the most powerful tools inside of the whole software okay this is called the shape builder tool so let's do an example let's say i am working on a piece of text right and i'm trying to create the letter t you kind of saw what i was doing earlier i'm trying to create a cool looking letter t here so let's take some examples so i've got something here i'm working on a t right something to be a little bit interesting so what i can do is i can take some of these things and say okay let's take all these objects here and use the shape builder okay so if I click and drag, you'll see that a little line pops up and it starts hovering over these objects. And I let go and it creates the shape. Now, if I click with the main select, I can click these other objects that I didn't combine in there. And it builds this into one single shape. So let's do it with a different example, okay? Let's say I wanna build a cute little cloud, okay? Let's do like, light blue with a little bit lighter blue stroke or something okay so i want to build a little cloud let's take the the fill here So I'm using my main select to move these around. I can draw more images or more shapes here. Okay. We have this shape here, but what I wanna do is turn this into one shape itself. I've got four different objects here. If I take that shape builder, I can just click and drag over all these different areas and let go and it creates a single shape there, right? super powerful now this is one shape that i can take and move all over the place right with Control c and Control v which is copy and paste but i've done that really quickly by just building shapes from a circle right Um, I want you to use the, the background that I have and it, and the background doesn't have to be part of your logo, but that's what I want you to try to derive your inspiration from. So pick one of those images and build a logo for one of those images. Okay. So the shape builder tool, super powerful. Okay. It really is the most powerful tool you have inside of the program. You can do all sorts of things, right? Let's say I wanted to build an interesting looking, you know, smiley face character here. I just highlight over all those objects and then hit shape builder and I can click those objects and it's going to punch out those objects out of my object right so almost like a hole punch because i had those shapes there no you're totally fine so the shape builder can really help you
create interest interesting shapes and objects very quickly. The rest of these are, are pretty easy to use, straightforward. This is the eyedropper tool. The nice thing about the eyedropper tool is it's a little bit more useful than the one in Photoshop because it will fill based on a, an object or a color you have selected. So let's say I have a rectangle here and I have this one. And let's say this rectangle has a different fill and stroke color, right? So if I click this one and then I want to change it to this, I just eyedropper, right? Or if I want to eyedropper and change this shape to this one, I just eyedropper this and it changes it. So a little bit more useful of an eyedropper tool. The rest of these, I'm not super worried about you using. This is the width tool. This one can be helpful. So let's say you were working on a path here, something like this. You can uh, turn off the, the fill here. But let's say you have this, um, the width tool here. If you click on this anchor and pull, you can change the width really quickly. It can just be useful to use. Way to create kind of interesting shapes quickly too, right? So that's the width tool. It just allows you to, to add a width to paths in a different way than you normally would. Um, and then you've got a couple other things in here. The blend tool, which it, it can be can be useful, right? And you can kind of see what it does. It morphs shapes and colors between two or more objects. So just for kicks and giggles, let's do it here. So let's say I've got my... Wow, that is a very large stroke on that square. So let's fill this with green. Same thing again. We'll take another cube. We'll make this one smaller. We'll take this and change this color. Okay. So if I have this and this, I can use the blend. Sorry. So that blends the shape and color between those two objects. I could do it backwards too if I wanted to. So kind of an interesting thing that you can do there. Um, how helpful it is to you, you can kind of determine that, right? But kind of a cool tool. So those are all the tools that we can talk about. There are so many more things over here on this end of Illustrator. It has a layer-based system very similar to Photoshop, right? Where I can have objects on layers I can lock different layers. I can add different colors to layers to, to give them a designation. I can turn layers on and off. Let's say I have something on layer one. I can copy that, go to layer two and paste that. And then when it's highlighted, you can tell what layer it's a part of based on the color you've assigned it in your layers. That can be nice too. So those layers work very similar to the Photoshop process. Libraries is something that I'm not too worried about showing you right now. Um, there is something in the interface that I want to talk about up here at the top, which is under the windows. There are so many different windows you can link over on the right hand side of your screen. This kind of coincides with what I was talking about over here. Sometimes you'll see when other creators are making stuff inside of Illustrator, their interface will look a little bit different than yours. You can go through here and kind of take a look at each one of these interfaces. This is a painting interface, right? This is a tracing interface. They've got all different types of interfaces here. This is the essentials interface. So it's just how they decide that they want to show the different pieces of 
the UI to you, right? So here's the essentials. It's kind of a tapered down version. There is one thing here that's kind of nice is having the arrange window um, or the align window over here. And I tend to try to put this one in this bar just because when you're working on a logo, let's say I'm drawing a shape over here. If I want to align this in perfectly in the center of my canvas, I can do that with the align tool. Pretty nice, especially when you're trying to do things and, and keep them, you know, even and nice on your page. So you can always, you know, align it to the center. Now I know I'm directly in the middle of this object. And if I'm trying to build a certain shape or something, I can say, all right, well, let's align this directly. Then I can use my shape tool, my shape builder tool. And now I know that I built a perfectly symmetrical shape here, right? So that's a nice part of Photoshop or not Photoshop, Illustrator. And I keep saying Photoshop, sorry. Um, the rest of these, you know, you have color guides, your, your color picker. Um, this is saving stuff to the creative cloud. But over here on the right hand side, this is all going to be based off of what object you're using, right? Or which tool you're using that, that, that properties tab is going to change based off what you have sort of selected. So you can take a look through those a little bit more. The, the thing with illustrator that I really feel like is the hardest thing to get used to is this pen tool and how that pen tool functions, right? So get used to how that works. Play around with that a little bit, play around with the shape tool. There's so many different things we can talk about and we'll talk about some more stuff next week. Um, as far as like, um, you know, just a couple different tips and tricks I have for you, but I don't want to throw too much of the software in your face today. So what I'd like you to do is just start coming up with some basic design things, start sketching things out in Photoshop or in, you could do it in Photoshop if you want, but start just kind of getting some rough placement things inside of Illustrator. Something I want to show you here is here's some, a couple different logos that I've built just for some companies. Okay. Um, so this one, you can see, I have a bunch of different logos here for this company that I was working with, right? But I've sketched out other things over here in the open space to see how I like them. And then I'm building other objects over here in these other places. I've, I've put a color palette together for something that they wanted me to work through, right? So I've just sketched out some of these objects. I've used some different, you know, things happening here, right? So you can feel free to use all of the space that you've got, right? And then when you start wanting to nail some things down, then align them to your canvas. I do that kind of all over the place. I did that with a few different logos that I've worked on. So, um, let's go ahead and I'm going to do, let's do a logo for the, uh, which game do I want to do it for? Or maybe I'll do it for a different image. Let's grab, um, Here's one. We'll just do this. And I'm just trying to keep something simple here. I don't know the name of this game and I don't recognize it. So we'll do something cutesy for this. Okay. So I have this one. I, the, the reason I don't want to do, how do you zoom with the scroll wheel? Oh, good. Good. Uh, good question. Um, let's do a new file here. We'll do a 1080 by 1080. So I'm zooming with the scroll wheel. I think it's the same process here. So if you go to edit preferences, um, I think it's under general. 
There's one that's zoom with scroll wheel. Yeah, right here. Under general, there's a zoom with mouse wheel button that you can turn on and off. Makes it way easier. However, I will give Illustrator its props here. Their zoom tool is so much better than Photoshop's. I click and I drag and uh, and I can zoom and then I can middle mouse button pan around. So it's just a way better tool than Photoshop's. So really the, this, this, the mouse wheel is nice, but this tool is much better. So, okay. So what I'm gonna do is take this little screenshot. I have no idea what this game is. Somebody probably does, but I'm gonna do a quick sort of logo design for this game. Um, something cutesy. Uh, let's go and take this image and drop it into We'll just drag and drop it in here real quick so I can put it off to the side The reason I don't want to do it for the same game that you guys are doing it for is I don't want you guys to copy me so um, what I want to do is kind of use this simple color palette that they've got going on here and kind of use some of the colors in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to lock this layer first. We'll call this reference. We'll lock this layer. And then I'm going to add a couple new layers here. So this one I'm going to call color palette. And what I'm going to do is just take a couple blocks here. You can kind of see how I did that with my other logo design that I was working on for that other company. Um, and I'm gonna take these and just throw a couple squares in here. And then I'm gonna color pick some objects here. So I'm gonna take, I'll select this and then color pick it like this color, kind of like that. Take this one and color pick and take their kind of yellowy color and we'll color pick this kind of blue that they've got going on and maybe we'll grab the green just because I kind of like that green color they've got too. So we'll take this and color pick this green. Okay. So. Um, do I want this pink? Yeah, let's grab the pink thing too. That's fine. And I don't, I may not end up using all of these, but just to try to do something cute here. Um, and I think, I don't know. This is where it's like, come up with a name for this game. I don't know. Something silly. Um... This, this game probably already has a name, so it, it does have a name. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to try to come up with something on the fly here. I kind of like the idea of this dark brown, too, so maybe we'll use that somewhere. Let's see. This is probably the hardest part is like, what do I want to name this? throw a new layer here and 
we'll call this the ideas layer. And I'm going to lock my color palette layer here just so I can't mess with it. Wash him all. <laughs> I like that. I don't know. I have no idea what to call this. Wash plus animal. Is that what they're doing? Is getting a wash? Is that what that is? That looks like a crane game to me. <laughs> See, look, you guys have good. You guys have some good ideas in there. See, I don't think you'll have much of a problem. Uh, let's see here. Let's call it. <laughs> it looks like a crane game or something. I don't know. But there's also like bubbles or something in there. So I have no idea. Uh, we'll call it like chibi comforts or something. I don't know. So now I want to take, um, it does say operate in the bottom. So it could be a little crane game or something. So I don't know. My idea is to kind of do a little kind of cute looking house, maybe with some text or maybe the little animal things. I don't know. We'll, we'll come up with something. So this is sort of like my sketch out phase where I'm like, okay, how do I want to design this? Got something like this. Sometimes it's nice to get a little inspiration too. Like I'm looking at like kind of cute house to see if I can figure out kind of 
how I want to lay this out. Here's where I can grab my pen tool. So I'm swapping back over to direct select now and I can do this sort of rounded deal here. I also kind of like this sort of erased line look that they have going on here too. So maybe I'll try to use the, that a little bit. So I can use uh, what's called a translate uh, transform reflect here. So if I control Z this, or I can also use the reflect here, I think. So this is, like I said, this is my sketch out phase. So I'm, I don't know how I feel about this. This is fine. Kind of like this here.
So another tool that we can talk about here really quickly is the path tool where I can join paths. So right now this is two individual paths. But if we highlight over this and go object and go to path and go join, now that's one path. I can also group objects together. So if I do object group, that now creates that into one object. So now I can kind of center that here.
Sure thing. Yep, no problem. Um, we can call it for today too. So I'm, like I said, we've got two weeks to do this. So I'm gonna keep brainstorming here a little bit. I kind of like the idea of doing these little characters here for the logo. Um, I do wanna try to play around with building my own font here. I was trying to see if I could come up with something I liked to do the, you know, and I'd have something maybe like this where I've got this hanging out here. And this is where you can kind of sketch it up in your brain, right? Here's my, and maybe I have some sort of house sitting around these like this. Right. So in my brain, how do I make this work? But so, um, just to, for the sake of keeping the stream, not a million hours long. This is the, the process I want you guys to go through today, okay? So we've sort of gone through and sketched out an idea, right? Messing with the tools. Um, we've, we've, t we've touched on the color palette, so we need to try to think of how to incorporate that. Maybe we incorporate it through the font. Um, I really do love this sort of brown and light cream color, so we'll probably end up using this for something. Maybe we'll we'll play make a play into more of these little guys that are here. Um, I do want to try to incorporate this sort of erased edge thing that they've got going on, but we'll get there. So um, I'm gonna let you all go, and I will see you guys next week. Okay. If there's any questions, make sure you hit me up on the Discord. Feel free to watch this back. We'll keep working through these logos for the next week or two, okay? So I will see you all next Monday, okay? Have a good one, everyone.